If you've taken an introductory course on Laplace transforms, you will quite early on have seen the definition at the bottom of this page that tells you how to take the Laplace transform of a function, little f of t. Quite soon after seeing the definition, you'll probably have tried some actual functions. Functions like the ones I've shown here, t to the n, or e to the at, or cos at. Along the way you will also have learned that there are restrictions on s. Those restrictions are usually imposed in order to make sure that the exponential has something negative in it. That allows the limit at infinity to have meaning. After a while doing such functions, you normally see a table with polynomials, exponentials, sine and cos, perhaps the hyperbolic sine and cos as well. Have you ever wondered, though, why those tables don't show the Laplace transform of, say, tan t, and why, to find the transform of log t, you'd have to look at more advanced tables? Well, if you've had access to a powerful mathematical computer package like Mathematica or Maple, you might even have asked it about these transforms. I'm guessing that if you asked for the Laplace transform of tan t, you'll have found that Mathematica, for example, hangs up. There's a good reason for that. Look at the graph of tan. It has an infinite number of vertical asymptotes. That means that the integral is just not defined. It doesn't have a Laplace transform. On the other hand, if you ask Mathematica for the Laplace transform of the natural log of t, you will find a result. But it's a rather strange looking result that might come as a surprise. I'm going to talk about that result here, though I won't be able to justify it fully with the level of mathematics available. Let's start with the definition. Here it is. If the transform of log t exists, then it would have to be such that it's just the value of this integral. s greater than 0 here, again, is imposed to make sure that the exponential dies away at infinity. When first faced with this integral, most people tried to integrate it by parts. I know I did a long time ago. Unfortunately, you quickly find that you just get another integral you can't do. And unlike the integral in which you have an exponential with a trig function, and you can get through by doing two integrations by parts, this one just gets worse and worse the more integrations you do. Well, perhaps before embarking on that process, we should have really asked ourselves about this integral and whether it can exist. Let's look at a graph of the function e to the minus st log t. I haven't said what s is, but it doesn't really matter. The general shape looks like this. The integral, of course, is the area between that graph and the t-axis. That ought to worry us a little bit. There are two ways in which that area might be infinite. First of all, far off to the right, because of the tailing exponential heading asymptotically to the t-axis, but also on the left, where the log plummets to negative infinity. The exponential, of course, on the left is very close to 1. So now, remembering that I've already told you that there is a Laplace transform, albeit a rather strange-looking one, that means that somehow these two infinite amounts of area must cancel out. In fact, that is what happens, though it's rather hard to show the details. OK, well, let's get on with things. Here is the Laplace transform. Minus gamma over s minus log s over s. Well. Not too worried about log s over s, maybe we can do something with that, but what on earth is gamma? I'm going to delay answering that question to a little bit later. First of all, though, I want to show you how that minus log s over s term comes about. Let's go back to the integral. What I'm going to do is to make a simple change of variables. I'm going to let st be called u. There we are, u equals st, and so it follows that du is the same as s dt. As far as u and t are concerned, s is just a constant, of course. In making the change of variables, we'll have to substitute for dt, so we'd better solve for it and write dt equals 1 over s du. Now, what about the limits? 
when t is 0, that's the bottom limit, u is also 0. When t gets very big and positive, assuming as we did that s is also big and positive, uh, sorry, is also positive, that means that u gets big and positive. So actually the limits on the integral will stay the same. But now the integral looks like the following. 0 to infinity. Instead of e to the minus st, we have e to the minus u. t is the same as u over s, and dt is 1 over s du. OK, that's interesting. There's a 1 over s. Looks like that might be where the 1 over s comes from in our Laplace transform. Let's do a little bit more with that integral. Let's expand the log using the usual rules of logs. I've also pulled out the 1 over s to the front. It doesn't depend on u, so it's a constant as far as this integral is concerned. The exponential is still the same, but I've written log of the quotient is now the difference of the logs, log u minus log s. OK, now let's break that up into two pieces. 1 over s in front, the exponential times log u, and then in the second integral here, minus log s has also been pulled out, because again, that's a constant as far as u is concerned. That second integral can now be performed. It's just the integral of an exponential. We get minus the same exponential. We substitute in the limits, 0 to infinity. When we substitute in the top limit, e to the negative infinity is thrown away, that's negligibly small. e to the 0 is 1, and of course it's minus because it's the bottom limit. So that's going to give us 1 over s and a minus log s. Unfortunately, there's still that first integral to do. However, we do now see the second piece of the Laplace transform, as I claimed above. Do you remember? Back up here, this one minus log s over s, well, we've got it. There it is. The gamma must then be connected with this other integral. Let's talk a bit about gamma now. The name of the integration variable, of course, doesn't matter. u or x or t really doesn't matter. The definition of gamma is the red line that I've shown here. Sure enough, that integral e to the minus u log u du is just negative gamma. But what is gamma and where does it come from? Well, it has a name. It's called the euler mascheroni constant. And it has a value. It's approximately 0.577. But actually, it's another of those numbers like e and pi. The numbers e and pi are known to be irrational. That means they can't be written as a ratio of two whole numbers. They're also known to be transcendental, which means that they can't be expressed as a combination of roots of whole numbers. It is believed that the constant gamma also possesses these properties, but so far nobody has been able to prove it for sure. It is, of course, much less well known than e and pi. Where did gamma first arise? Well, it's connected with something known as the harmonic series. The harmonic series is the sum of terms you get if you add up all the fractions formed from 1 over each whole number, as shown here. The series is taken to go on forever to infinity. You just keep adding on the next number. Early on, people thought that this series probably ought to converge to something. But actually, if you keep adding on numbers, you'll find that it never does converge. It just gets bigger and bigger all the time. It gets bigger and bigger very slowly, though. I'm sure you can see that, because the things you're adding on are getting smaller and smaller. Even to reach a value of 10, it would take many hundreds or thousands of terms. We can write the harmonic series with summation notation, which means it's a bit easier to handle. Now, once people recognize that this series diverges, i.e. gets bigger and bigger, they started to ask, well, how quickly does it get bigger? And they recognized that it was fairly slow. So they wanted something to compare it with. It turns out that this series gets bigger and bigger at about the same rate as log n. So, for example, 
the difference between the truncated harmonic series, that is, where you stop it at some high value, and the log of that high value approaches a constant as n, that high value, gets bigger and bigger. That constant is, in fact, the euler mascheroni constant. It's been calculated to many millions of decimal places by now. And it appears in a number of rather uh, complicated and abstract areas of mathematics, including number theory. The proof that our integral is equal to negative gamma is a little bit beyond the scope of what we can do here. But I hope to have inspired your interest in this topic. Let's finish by writing down again the Laplace transform of log of t.